that I can share this with anybody who has other stuff going on this morning that can't attend. Um, so I just hit record, so we'll send that out. Um, and then basically the purpose of this meeting really is for training. Uh, just we, we want to take the opportunity to get this group of people together on a regular basis and provide training that's kind of real time based on what we're seeing in the field and uh, you know just have an opportunity to give that to you on a more frequent basis um, to give it directly to auditors and QCI um, from the state and then give you guys an opportunity to ask questions because you guys are the front line you guys are seeing um, what's really happening out there and you're the best group to tell us whether or not you know this guidance and some of these tools whether or not they're helpful so so I encourage you guys to participate in this meeting I realize where it's a webinar and you can't you can't see everybody else in the room sometimes it's hard to participate but please speak up and participate as as needed um, so this uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen um, I typically like to follow a little bit of an agenda where we'll just go over anything that we went over in our last meeting that still pertains to what's going on uh, and then go over a little new business and then we'll have that main training topic and uh, my goal is to keep this meeting to about 45 minutes uh, sometimes it runs long if you guys have questions um, and that's okay if anybody if we get to the 8 45 9 o'clock time and we're still talking but you guys have places to go or things to do feel free to drop off the call and go do your work you won't hurt anybody's feelings at all um, the only old business I had was just basically to take a minute and talk about the auditor trainings that are coming up we did hold our first auditor training a few weeks ago at the training center uh, we had four people who were able to pass the BPI auditor what is that certification, certification. yeah um, and it went smooth enough for our first go round we also took the opportunity to learn a few new things while we were up there at the training center I was one of the participants and I I had a good experience um, so in preparation for those who uh, who will be attending when's our next one is that uh, it's, in a week or two yeah in two weeks yeah so anybody who will be attending that class or the one in November um, remember to get on and take care of your prerequisites you're you got to get onto the LMS um, if you have not if you didn't do you the QCI stuff you have to go through all of the training on the LMS and that can take a long time um, I want to say it took me like three full days maybe Is that That's it was right. it took me so you need to plan a week if you haven't gone through that uh, you should get started right away and spend a few hours a day on it uh, also there's a lot of math on the auditor stuff so I think Wade went in for everybody whether you went through the training or not and unlocked the math section of the LMS I think you unlocked everything didn't you? I unlocked it all. So if you've been through it before you can go back through it again as a review and then the so the prerequisites are that you've been through all of it at least once so if you've already done that for your QCI you're covered um, but then there is one new prerequisite there that you have to go and address and that's the the book the home performance diagnostics home performance diagnostics book you have to read the book you have to do all of the exercises in that book except for a couple of them that Wade emailed about and you have to go to the LMS to take a test uh, for me to go through that book and to take the test, it took me it took me about twelve hours. Okay. So, and I'm a, I'm a little bit of a slow reader, um, but I also understood most of the concepts. So, 
take that for what it's worth. Make sure you're giving yourself plenty of time to do that. Does anybody have any questions on what they have? The auditors have to do to prepare for and to cover the prereqs for the auditor trainings. And if you haven't got your prereqs done, I'll be getting in touch with you uh, first of next week to remind you because the class, next class is the week after that. So you'll hear from me if you're lagging. Um, just looking at a chat, Josh, and uh, you guys down at Five County, were you, are you able to hear me now or do you still need an audio link? No, we got it. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm hearing no questions about that. Uh, the only other old business thing is for auditors um, in preparation for the audit monitoring. I The offer still stands. I will review as many audits as you want to send me prior to me coming. Um, and I'll give you feedback directly just between you and me. And, uh, and that feedback won't be reflected in any monitoring. So if you would like... If you'd like me to look at what you're doing right now so that you can, you know, make any changes or uh, just take comfort in the fact that you're doing your, you know, do, already doing well, feel free to send me copies of audits. Um, I ask that you sanitize them as much as you can or if you need to, just contact me to uh, work out a way to send that audit to me so that we're not compromising your client's information. So send something to me or reach out to me and we'll work together to get it. That's all the old business I had. Uh, Wade or Dalton, do you guys have anything that we've covered in the past that you want to address? Nothing I can think of. There, there is something I want to talk about on combustion analysis when we get into the training part. But okay. Other than that, I think I don't have anything. Sounds good. Um, and then the only new business that I wanted to make sure that this whole group was aware of is that the guidelines, the guidelines, especially on the audit, but the whole the whole set of state guidelines um, that are attached to this year's grant, they all became effective last week, and they're all now uh, available on the training center website. So. If any of you have been using uh, this, this jobs.utah.gov website, we are, we are going to stop updating this website. Uh, this is where I have been going for all of my resources, but uh, we, we've kind of been servicing both sites, and we're going to stop using this site, and we're going to just go to the IWTC site from this point forward. So, so change your bookmarks, um, and if make sure that everybody knows how to get there. It's the URL is IWTCUtah.org, and then uh, when you get there, if you'll click on, it's the same idea. It's just a resources tab. So you click on that tab, and it, you'll you'll have all of the guidance that you need. But as you'll notice here, the, we have our program guidelines, which is the 2016 version. Um, and this, this section, or the, these guidelines, now have the, uh, the large version of, of the section B9, which is all the guidance on the energy audit. So I've been training all the auditors on it for the past year and we've been we've basically been we should have all been following all these rules but now the rules are finally in the guidelines they are effective uh, they are part of your contracts and so each agency should be following all of these guidelines as of really as of July 1 but you know the effective date on this is September 1 or 2 so make sure that you are uh, using this this new link that you're using the current guidelines and make sure that everybody in your agency is aware of where to find them. Any questions on that? All right. Uh, that's all the, the new business I had. Um, so if 
any unless anybody has anything else that they want to have questions about or want to talk about before we get into our training topic. You may have anything. All right. Um, do you want to talk about CO analysis first or after, worst case? Um, we can probably just do it now. <clears throat> so I have a question. Um, when it comes to doing combustion analysis on a water heater, where should the probe go? Who can answer that question? What was that? Down inside. inside the flue. Down inside the flue. Before what? Before the draft hood. Before the draft hood. Okay. I just want to make sure that everyone understands that. Wait, um, why do we have to do it before the draft hood? The reason we do it before the draft hood is because the draft hood allows dilution air to enter the flue. So it's just a spot where all this excess air can enter the flue. It helps the flue vent. Um, it helps eliminate condensation, and by its name, dilution, it dilutes the flue gases. So what we've seen in our monitoring is just some, you know, misunderstanding and people taking their combustion analysis in the wrong spot on draft hood equipped appliances, which 99% of the time for us is a water heater. could be a boiler with a draft hood, too. But if you take your combustion analysis after the draft hood or draft diverter, you're going to get skewed readings. You're going to get significantly lower flue temperatures because of the mix of all the cooler room air. Your CO readings are going to be substantially lower. So, for example, you could have an actual CO reading before the draft hood of 200 parts per million. But if you take it or I'm sorry, before the draft hood of 200 parts per million, but if you take it after the draft hood because of all the excess air that's in there, the dilution air, you might see a reading of 10 parts per million. So it's critical that you understand where to take that reading, and it's got to be before the draft diverter. In some cases, you may have to drill a hole right in the draft diverter to get your probe to go down into the flue before it, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with you drilling a hole in the draft diverter. There's already a great big hole in it anyway, so it's not going to hurt to drill a hole, a three-inch hole, to get your probe down in there. Um, but, again, it's just something we saw in our monitoring, and it's just, you know, someone was taught to do it this way a long, long time ago, and that's what got passed on. And so I just want to make sure you all understand on any draft hood equipped appliance, which, again, 99% of the time is going to be a water heater. could also be a boiler. Um, any draft hood equipped furnaces we work on, we're typically just replacing those anyway. But just make sure that you're getting your sample in undiluted flue gases, which always means before the draft hood or draft diverter or before anywhere dilution air might enter the system. So this little picture on the screen, and correct me if I'm wrong on all this, uh, I get to play the layman, right? <laughs> so this is the draft diverter or the draft hood right correct and it's because it has it's got this space underneath here where the air is getting sucked in and and it mixes with the gases so correct. that's where it gets diluted yep so if i was to drill a hole up here in the vent and take a measurement then i'm i've already mixed in a bunch of outside air so my co levels would be yep. much lower than they really are exactly so what you'll see is going to be really very high. low co very high O2, very high excess air, and lower than normal flu temperatures. Okay, So if you see things like that, for example, if you get a combustion tape, especially on a back rack, and your O2 is above 16%, the back rack won't even give you a reading of CO. Back racks have to have an O2 level below 16% to even start doing math to give you the readings. So if you're getting those really high readings, maybe you better look at where your probe's at. And that's one of the things we saw in our monitoring was a lot of tapes with exactly those, those traits. Um, really high O2, really high excess air, low flue temperatures, and low CO. And it was just simply because there was some confusion about where they should be taking those samples. And sometimes the confusion arises because you take a draft reading well above the draft diverter, and so they were drilling a hole to get a draft reading and doing their combustion reading in the same hole. 
So just remember, guys, combustion before the draft diverter. Draft reading needs to be, when possible, 12 to 18 inches above the draft diverter or past the first elbow in the system. And then that hole you're talking about, like I've seen, I, I typically drill mine right here, but mm -hmm. the whole purpose of the hole is to allow me to stick my probe down inside the water heater or basically inside the exhaust system so that my probe is now well before the dilution air. Absolutely. So. Now, sometimes you can get your probe in the existing hole in the draft hood and, you know, tweak it and get it to go down in there. That works sometimes. Um, sometimes it just simply does not work. So you've got to uh, drill a hole, usually in the draft hood. That's what I do. It works really well. I don't even care if you don't plug that hole back up because it's not going to hurt anything to leave that hole there. Look at the giant hole that already exists. That being said, for our client's peace of mind, it's usually a good idea to put some kind of plug back in the hole because they don't understand. You drill a hole in their flu and they're convinced that you're going to kill them because you've done that. So, so if I put a plastic plug in there, am I good? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Flu temperatures on those are typically upwards of 500 degrees. So some kind of stainless steel plug or a screw of some sort, something that won't melt or corrode away. Cool. Any questions or any feedback or comments from anybody? Or best practices? Oh, and, and just a side note, every stainless steel plug that's uh, advertised as stainless steel, especially on Amazon, and if it comes from a uh, one of those other third world countries isn't really stainless steel. So just be aware of that. It's, sta it's stained nickel? <laughs> it's, it's stained nickel and it will corrode and rust and turn to crap in a hurry, especially because blue gases are very corrosive. So just be aware of what kind of plug you're putting in there. Good to know. So even like I, I've, I've used, I use plastic on the PVC. That's the best choice. Because it's not high temp, but but maybe if you if you are using a true stainless on PVC, it wouldn't be yeah, an issue. Yeah, if you're using true stainless on PVC, that's okay. But like even at the training center, we ordered some so-called stainless steel plugs, I think from Amazon. And, and I realize, guys, there's different kinds of stainless steel, and some is better than others. And so the stainless steel plugs, in quotations, that we had at the training center, I noted we're starting to rust on our 90% furnace because they're crappy stainless steel. There's there's different kinds of stainless. I can't remember all the numbers in my head. So for PVC flues, quite honestly, um, plastic plugs are the best choice. Again, because flue gases, especially flue gases with a lot of condensation, are highly corrosive. Um, you can get the plastic PVC plugs at Lowell's, Home Depot, Amazon, any place like that. But for a water heater or a boiler or something with a draft hood where the flue temperatures are, you know, three to 500 degrees, plastic plugs won't do. So some sort of good stainless steel plug or, a, you know, sheet metal screw or I've seen people use uh, bolts or whatever, just something that won't melt or corrode away over time. And again, on a water heater flue, quite honestly, you don't have to plug that hole. I would never say anything to you if you didn't, but because our clients don't understand and I've had it happen, you drilled a hole in my flu and you left that hole there, you're going to kill us. You know, rather than fight that fight with them, put something in the hole. All right, any other questions or comments on the CO uh, readings and stuff? What's that, Lauren? Nothing. The 12-grip foster mouth would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> getting comments from the peanut gallery here in the background. Uh, we're up in Logan this morning, so Lauren's, Lauren's making us laugh. Um, okay, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to go over today is, is uh, this worst case draft short form. Um, and I just, I realized recently that I probably have never sat down with this group and, and walked anybody through this form. Uh, I kind of, we, we made the form into a, 
two or three pager and then there was a request to see if we could put it onto a one pager and that's what this short form is you're welcome to use I we call them the long form or the short form you can use either one uh, it does not matter I think the long form has more instruction I've, I've seen fewer errors on it um, so I'm not going to take the time to go through the long form uh, I wanted to just go through the short form today uh, I personally prefer the short form because because I can see all the information in, in one on one page in front of me but you're welcome to use whatever you want at your agencies uh, also before I start going through this form um, I just wanted to, to note that uh, the tech log, um, that software where you can actually log the draft pressure, that is extremely helpful uh, when you're doing your worst case draft tests. It is not required at the state level, but your agency, your coordinator may have made a decision to require it at your agency. And we fully support your coordinator in doing that. I, I think it's very wise to run the tech log. Um, so if your coordinators ask you to do that, make sure you're doing that. If you feel like it would be uh, helpful, you know, go ahead and start doing it. The tech log, if you're not familiar with that, that's, uh, that's this. I'll see if it'll open up here. It's the software. You can get it from the Energy Conservatory, and it'll just basically log the draft pressures th uh, that your manometer is reading. And when you're doing a worst-case draft test, it helps you to, to see... Uh, exactly what's happening when each appliance turns on. So if you want additional training on that, either speak up when we talk about additional training topics here in a minute, or reach out to Wade or Dalton or myself, and we can provide additional training on that. Um, but yeah, so so you can use the tech log in conjunction with this, but you you know may or may not have to. So. But what I wanted to do, I actually just want to walk through this form and I'll kind of list, fill it out together. If anybody has questions as I'm going, let's talk about them. Um, hopefully uh, answer some questions, clarify a few things. So when you're filling this form out, when you're filling out any form in the file, you, you've got to remember the, the, that thing that your English teacher taught you back in seventh grade that you have to consider your audience. And your audience in this case is going to be one of the state guys or someone at the federal level. You're documenting all of this for us. Your audience could also be a lawyer because somebody just died and now they're looking at this because they've requested it through a public public records request. You know, all of these things are doomsday scenarios, but that is why we are keeping these records is, you know, so that we can show that we did our job correctly. Um, so bear that in mind and you know when when you're looking at this and you're going well why in the world do I need to check this box it just seems so unnecessary consider your audience. Uh, I, I try to my audience is always a federal auditor who knows nothing about weatherization um, so I try to make things as clear as I possibly can for that person in the hopes that anybody else could pick this up and read it and make sense of it. So with that in mind, the, as a general rule, you just need to fill out everything. Like fill in every blank that you possibly can when you're filling out a form. So let's go ahead and fill this form out for a Bob Smith. Uh, this job number box would be probably the only box that that I don't care if you fill out, but you you may like to fill that out at your agency, or your coordinators may want you to fill that out because that's how you guys keep track of your jobs. Uh, my goal is to have some sort of identifier on the form so that I know very clearly which job this form goes to. So you either need a client name or a job number or both to be thorough. So make sure you're filling those out. Uh, you need to put the technician is, is the person that actually conducted the test. So if I am the one that uh, did this worst case draft test, then I'm going to put my name on here. And you want to put the date of the test, and we'll say the date of the test is this morning. Can I interject here real quick? Um, 
one thing we see, me and Dalton see in our monitoring, and it's, it's we're constantly reminding people, is complete and accurate paperwork. And we see a lot of paperwork with missing signatures, no technician, no one signed it. And so we'll be hitting you for that stuff, reminding you, I guess is a better word than hitting you. We'll be reminding you about complete and accurate paperwork especially signing your name to it. Someone's got to sign off. Hey, I checked this. Hey, I did this type of stuff. So that's important. It's another thing we're just seeing, seeing some areas where we're maybe a little weak in is complete and accurate paperwork. Yeah, I, I, I second what Wade said. That's Unfortunately, that's a lot of what uh, we have to monitor too is, is making sure that everything was filled out properly. Okay, so the next, this next section, I put this in here because of exactly what Wade was just talking about. I started going through client files where I would see like two or three copies of, of a worst case draft test, and there was no indication of when the test took place, like at what stage it took place. Hopefully, there was usually like a, a a date of the test somewhere on the test and then I could kind of line them up but even then sometimes the dates wouldn't align with the date that the audit took place or the date that the audit was first run and just poor documentation left way too many questions in some of these files so so you're putting the, the date that you've conducted the test here and then here you're going to select basically the stage that the test happened at. Uh, for auditors, you're just going to check pre-weatherization. Uh, if you're, if it's uh, someone who's out in the field, you've, you've, you've conducted some major measures that will have an impact on the pressure of the home before you leave for the day. You're going to uh, perform a worst-case test. You just check here, and you'd say, well, you know, after we installed Windows. So. That's why that box is there, so that you can check the box and then you can just write down what happened. Um, and then that way, you know, the next day you might be insulating the house and you could check the box and put insulation. And now you have a very clear track record of what happened at each step and how each step, you know, impacted the uh, pressure in the CAS and, and whether or not your appliances were drafting. And then your post weatherization, that's uh, at your final or that's your QCI is conducting that. So you can check that box there. If Matt, you're checking, go ahead. I'm just wondering where that's located at. What do you mean? Where is that? Where is that? Where is that? Where is that? Where's the form located at? If it, oh, I got, the form? you said it's on the new, or on the IWTC Training Center site. So I just looked I there, there and there. I don't see it. Okay. I, uh, Brad and I actually talked about this last week, and I did not go through and, and uh, verify that all of our forms are there. So I will make sure that this form gets put there uh, this week. And I'll send out an email to this group once that's done. So if you don't, if you don't have this form, uh, I'll make sure there's a link there. And so you can access that this week. All right, thanks. I think, I think if you go to the other, the old website, it may be there, but I, I, I'm not even certain on that. I know there's been, just been a few times where I've just emailed this form out. So and I, I think Brad was going to kill the old website like yeah. real soon. So you might not even be able to get to the old website anymore. It's still there oh, as of this morning. Right. But but yeah, that's it's <clears> going to go away. But yeah, thank you for that because it, it's that kind of stuff. Like you'd think that we would think of that. <laughs> and sometimes we just forget stuff like that. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, anyway, so just select the text testing stage. We'll pretend that this is uh, during weatherization that we just installed the windows today and we conducted our test when we left. So um, the next section on the form is that basically you're going to calculate your minimum acceptable draft pressure. And that's we're going to calculate that so we know what our target is, what you know, what we're shooting for uh, for these appliances to draft at. And to do that, uh, I have I have not put the math on this form. Uh, when you do your audit and your QCI certifications, you should become very familiar with the 
uh, with the formula. Um, it's it's basically just outdoor temperature minus 40. Outdoor temperature divided, divided by, by 40, 40 minus and then minus 2.75. Um, on the long form, the formula is written out. On this form was designed so that so this morning in Logan at the airport it was 35 degrees. So if I was if I was conducting this test this morning at 7 a.m. when it was 35 degrees, then uh, this form should calculate your minimum acceptable draft. Now I have run into uh, those agencies or some auditors who are having troubles where the form is not calculating this because of basically because of the app that they're using. So check and make sure that your form is calculating it. If it is not, um, I built this with using Adobe software. Uh, so I would say consider using Adobe apps to read it or to use it. Um, the other app that we use is a, uh, What's the PDF viewer or whatever we use uh, on our... I PDF use PDF Ex Expert. PDF, PDF Exchange. Yeah, on, on an Apple product, we use PDF Expert, which yeah. which also reads... This is just a little bit of... Uh, I can't even think of the code. Anyway, it's, it's some, some standard computer code. Um, so you'd think that most apps will read it, but some do not. So... so the first time or two that you use this, do the math yourself and check it. And make sure that that is working. But uh, so anyway, all you, if it's working well, then you know the goal is that you just put the temperature in here, and that's in Fahrenheit, and it'll do the math for you, and it'll tell you what your minimum acceptable draft is. Now, I kind of debated on whether to do that before you do your worst case depressurization or after. Because it's really you want you're going to use this number down here when we're when we're talking about our worst case pressure in the dra in the vent of the appliance. Uh, but I like to know what that is before I start other things. So hopefully that doesn't confuse anybody. Um, but that's where I put it on the form. The other thing I put on the form is uh, I just tried to um, do some shorthand to remind you for your uh, setup, for your CAS depressurization. So these are the general steps for setup. It just says, just as a reminder, you have to have a cold vent. Your combustion appliances should be off. You want to put the home in wintertime conditions. Your interior door should be open. Your exterior vents should be closed. Your wintertime condition puts all your exterior windows and doors closed as well. Your furnace filter should be clean, your dryer should be empty, and the filter on the dryer should be clean. So if you're ever looking for steps on how to do that, they're listed in detail on the long form. They're, they're uh, summarized right there. And then, uh, so the next step is your CAS depressurization. And to start that, uh, you're going to list your starting CAS pressure. So let's say that our starting CAS pressure is a 1.2. Um, negative or positive? That's positive. And yeah, Wade just asked if that's negative or positive, and, and that, that is key here. You've got to make sure that you put the sign, uh, you know, off of your uh, manometer indicating what the actual pressure is. Uh, another thing before I get into the worst case depressurization, I put these check boxes here. Uh, where you can indicate whether or not a tech log is attached and whether or not there was more than one CAS. So if you ever run into an issue where there's more than one CAS, you're going to have to go through the depressurization on each CAS. So if I was to check the multiple CAS box, then I would be, at the federal auditor or the state auditor would then know, wait a second, okay, after they installed the windows, there should be two forms or one or, or more than one form on uh, on uh, this house where they did the key CAS depressurization test on both of those CASs. Um, so I'd be looking for more than one document if that was checked. And then if the tech log is attached, uh, then by checking that box, when you're done with this form and when you've signed it down here, again, if, if this went to court, then 
you've signed here and you, this document says that it would have a tech log attached and all of those pieces would be put together as one legal document. So that's really why that's there. Just if you ever need it, that's why it's there. Okay, so CAS depressurization, our starting pressure is a positive 1.2. So the first step we're going we're gonna to take is we're going to go through the house and we're going to turn on all of our exhaust fans. And we're going to watch our manometer and we're going to see what kind of impact that has on the pressure in the CAS. Now, if I was to turn on exhaust fans uh, and it dropped my pressure down to a 0 0.8, so we're still positive, but it's lower than before, and that's, that happened when I turned the exhaust fans on, so I'm going to indicate that the exhaust fans were on and that the pressure went to a 0 0.8. The next step is we're going to you know, leave the exhaust fans on. Now we're going to turn that dryer on. The dryer is empty, the filter is clean, so it's going to be able to exhaust the most air. And we're going to see if that has any, any impact on the uh, CAS. So we turn our dryer on and that drops us down to a negative 0 0.4. So again, I want to indicate that the dryer is on, and then we're going to log our pressure. Uh, the next step is we come to the air handler. Now we're going to turn our air handler on, and if the air handler pushed our pressure up to a 1.2, then what would we do? Anybody out there in the void have an answer to that? What should we do on this form? Turn it back off. Turn it back off, and then what? What do I put on the form? Off. And what goes here? The, uh, back to the, what it was before. The negative point four. Correct. So by, by doing that, I can now see that the, the, the action that put the CAS in the worst depressurization was to leave the air handler off, and the pressure in the CAS when the air handler was off was at a negative 0 0.4. <clears throat> this, I'm seeing a little bit of confusion with this. Uh, if, if you were to turn your, uh, if you put it on and you show that it went back up to a positive, that's, that shows me that it is, well, if you record it that way and then you moved on to the next step, that leaves me with questions about whether or not you really put the CAS in, into the uh, most negative condition. Because the last thing we want to see is that this was at a positive 1.4 and then you went on and, and closed the CAS doors, right? That, that means you didn't do your depressurization properly. That, that will start us asking questions. And we've seen, in fact, when we're done here, I'll talk a little bit about some examples that me and Dalton have seen out in the field. And so. Anyway, so yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, you'd, you'd indicate that the air handler was off and you'd log the uh, CAS pressure when it's off and it's worst case. Um, I, I realize that uh, in most cases your exhaust fans, your dryer, and they'll typically be on, but there are weird scenarios and that's why I put the option here so that you can clearly indicate whether they're on or whether they're off. So please make sure you're filling that out correctly because that, that's, that's information that we must have in order to uh, determine you know, and, and put the CAS in its worst case. So the next one is fireplaces. Now, uh, we made some policy changes a little while ago, and we had a discussion about going back and changing this form, and when I went back to look at the form, I realized there was no change needed. So the change in the policy is that, uh, that you, you no longer have to simulate a fireplace if the fireplace is not the primary source of heat or if the fireplace doesn't get used that much. If you go into a home and you see that they are using it on a regular basis, you need to simulate the fireplace. Or 
more importantly, if the fireplace is their primary source of heat, you must uh, simulate the fireplace as part of your worst case or your CAS depressurization. So if there's one fireplace, it's uh, you're going to 300 Pascal of, 300 or 300 CFM, CFM. Nope. of negative. Nope. Use your blower door. Use your blower door to simulate an exhaust fan, so depressurize. 300 CFM per fireplace is the industry standard. So if there's two fireplaces, I'm running my blower door to Six, negative 600, 600 CFM. 600 CFM. Yep. Yeah. And we all know, we all know what the end result will be. Okay. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. We all know what that end result's going to be, but we've got policy in place to address that with the client. Now, one thing here, so I've just selected one, and then I, like, accidentally selected it. I want to deselect it. This form won't let you deselect it. So if I if there is no fireplace in the home or the fireplace is rarely or never used, all you need to do is put an NA in the box. If you accidentally select this or if you feel like you need to give some further explanation, uh, use the box, the notes box down here to help clarify what's going on on the form. So, so on the fireplaces, you'd either indicate that there is a fireplace and then you'd note your CAS pressure or you'd just say it doesn't apply. Uh, CAS doors open or closed. Uh, this, is, this is the one where you always need to test it and it may not be limited to your, you know, you may have multiple doors that really impact the CAS. You're going to have to determine that. If you had multiple doors, again, you've got the notes section where you could describe more what's going on. Um, but uh, in this case, let's say when our CAS door is open, then, uh, or sorry, let's say when it's closed, that it pushes uh, our CAS down to a negative 1.3. And then this last section is just other. Like if there's anything else in the home, if there's something weird that they've got going on uh, that is not, easily represented here. You've got a space to do that. I've used this a time or two for other doors that, you know, I, you know, I might say that the door at the top of the stairs or something. Um, but uh, in this case, you can either leave these two blank if you want to, or you can just put none or NA over here. And then when you're all done, the number that you're going to put in here is the worst case CAS pressure, which in this case was what? That's, that's as negative as, as we could possibly get that CAS was down to a negative 1.3. So that's our answer right there. Now, what does this number have to do with this number? Nothing, right? Absolutely nothing. Okay. Just, just check and make sure you guys are awake out there. All right. And then, then now we're on to uh, testing our appliances. Before you move on. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention, because I know you guys are going to hear about it, um, you know, because we do the BPI certification, BPI in their new 1200 standard is eliminating CAS depressurization testing. They, they used to have the standards, and all of you that have been through the tests, you know, uh, negative 3 for an orphaned water heater, negative 5 for a standalone water heater, so on and so forth. BPI is getting rid of that, but that doesn't mean that we stop doing this because this is like being a, det a detective. We're trying to find out what could possibly be causing the spillage. So knowing this information guides you. It may be that your negative CAS pressure is indeed causing your spillage. It may be something else. But going through this process gives you the clues. Gives you, okay, I can see. I, aha, I turn the dryer on and suddenly my CAS goes very, very negative. That's a clue that possibly your dryer is what's causing your problem. And it allows you to formulate some kind of solution. So although you're going to hear BPI is eliminating the CAS depressurization standards, that doesn't mean that we're going to stop doing this. I, knowing that they were eliminating it, I actually put the CAS depressurization standard into the auditor guidelines. Uh, I, I think it's very valuable information. It is a guideline. If you have a, if your CAS is a negative five and you've got that standalone water heater, it's okay. It's just an indication of something else. And, and so we're going to continue to teach it and use it. 
Uh, so now we're going to measure our draft pressure. Now that our CAS is in the worst or the most depressurized we can get it. Did somebody have a comment? Yeah, I did, Matt. It's Brent. Yeah. So to get your worst case and you're following that form, Yeah. I think you need to check your CAS door with your air handler running. Yes. yes. Even if it says with, that it goes to a, a less negative pressure and you turn it off, when you shut that CAS door, you need to check that with the air handler running. That's a great point. Under most scenarios, if you'll just follow steps one through eight, that works most of the time. But what Brent's saying is every once in a while, uh, your CAS doors, like if your air handler was off and you and you tested your CAS doors first, it'll actually indicate some other weird pressure thing going on, and then your air handler could push it positive or negative. And so sometimes you need to test these things in different order. Um, the training center is a great example because you can yeah. you can get it to do that. And we've been we've been kind of teaching you guys that you know when you turn on that air handler, that's that's all good and fine. But you've also got to throw those doors into the equation. And when we're all done here, we'll talk about a scenario that me and Dalton ran into out in the field that just was kind of a shocker to everyone. But you've got to, Brent's exactly right, you can have an air handler that, you know, depending on the condition of the doors, maybe causes your CAS to go more positive. But then where it, when the air handler's running and you close those doors, now all of a sudden you're in a negative condition. And that's why I keep harping on, you've got to be a detective here. You've got to do some sleuthing. To just check the boxes is not enough. Um, it would be very hard for us to make a form that covered every scenario because it would be very cumbersome. Um, I like this short form, but you still need to be aware of the fact. Turn that air handler on, turn that stuff on, and play with your door closure because we, we've seen it in the field in our monitoring, and it's you know just the, the QCI or the auditor thought they had developed worst case when in actuality they did not because they missed the door closure while something was running. So it's imperative that you uh, go through the process, be the detective, understand the physics and science behind it, and, and play with the door closure because Brent is spot on. Thanks. Um, just really quick, we're getting very close to 9 a.m., so we will we will continue this training right now. Um, and, and I want to take time for questions and stuff, but if you've got work, if you've got a job you got to get to or something else going on, feel free to drop off the call. I will send a, a recording of this out in an email later today so you can uh, catch the tail end of it when it's convenient for you. Okay, so we're going to measure our draft pressure. Let's uh, start with a water heater. And while the CAS is in its most negative, we measure our cold vent pressure. So we haven't fired the appliance yet. Um, and give me a good cold vent pressure. Uh, under worst case, let's call it positive 1.5. So weight's giving us 1.5. So that's with our probe where? 12 to 18 inches above the draft hood or past the first elbow in the flue. I understand you can't always get there because of the physical condition of your flu, but do your best to get 12 to 18 inches above the draft hood or past the first elbow in the flu. All right. And then, so we fire the water heater, and after 60 seconds, mm -hmm. hopefully we got the, uh, what do you call that, the curve of glory or something like that? <laughs> I can't remember what you're calling it. Anyway, after, within that 60 second time period, and BPI may extend that standard to two minutes, but as of right now, we're measuring vent pressure after six, 60 seconds. And uh, if all, if, if your appliance is working well, then we should see it go negative. And let's say that it goes to negative 2.3. So if we get there, it goes to negative 2.3, the next thing is you need to document that you actually thought and made a decision, did this pass or fail? Was this draft acceptable or not? So in this case, what was it acceptable? Yes. What are we comparing it to? Negative one point eight. Yeah. Yes, Our minimum acceptable draft. 
So if it's more negative than negative 1.88, then yes, it passes. Uh, now, say we had a furnace sitting next to it, and it's an old 60 percenter, and our uh, starting vent pressure was uh, weird, and let's say it was really positive. And uh, after a 60-second test on this vent, we were at a negative 0 0.2. Did this one pass? Smallest oh yeah, Dalton's saying remember to start with the smallest BTU appliance, and then the other thing that makes this test, you know, a little cumbersome is that once you started with that, if these two share a flu, you have to wait until you have a cold vent or a cold flu. You have to wait till that flu gets back down to room temperature. So this test can take a little while if you've got appliances. Yeah, if your blower door is there, you can. Uh, negatively pressurize the house and suck air through the blower door or suck air through the vent and help cool it down quicker but so if this one fails then we're going to indicate that it fails and then you'll notice on this form I just put this box around here just to help you go oh well it failed now I have to go back and do this test so if it fails then you want to go back and do it under normal case which means your CAS will not be depressurized so you'll turn off your exhaust fans You'll turn off your dryer fan. You'll put the house just into normal conditions. You'll wait till the vent has cooled. You'll measure your vent pressure again. And, uh, and then you'll, let's say our vent pressure under normal condition is a 1.5. And you'll, or sorry, let's make that a negative 1.5. Now, this one is, uh, this is, again, your vent pressure after 60 seconds. This is not your cold vent pressure. It's just your, you know, under normal case, after 60 seconds, you know, what happened to your vent pressure, and then you have to determine whether it passed or failed. So in this case, did it pass or fail? Failed. Failed? Yeah, this one failed under normal case, it failed under worst case. If it fails... One of the things I want you to do is I want you to write down your CO level right here on this form because it's part of the decision. So let's say our CO level on this appliance is 25 parts per million. Now, we're going to come down here. Once we've run our test, you need to come to a conclusion. And so the conclusion is, the first one, there are no combustion appliances in the dwelling, so no further testing was required. So if you ever run into a house that's all electric, then you can check that box. You can document it one time, and you don't have to run your test anymore, right? But I we want you to actually document in the file. So that would be your auditor would document that the first time they're in the home, and then everybody after that does not have to deal with it. Uh, the next option is uh, that the conclusion is not applicable because all combustion appliances are direct vented. So... You could come to a home where they're all direct vented, or at some point during your uh, weatherization, the the home would get to a point where they're all direct vented appliances, and you wouldn't need any further testing. The guy who installs that appliance is the last guy that would fill this out. So he would fill that out for that day, check that box, and that should be in the file indicating that you know we did our worst case testing right up to the point where we didn't need to do it anymore. Next conclusion is pass. So everything passed, right? And all combustion appliances passed the worst case draft test and they're venting safely. If you ever have to check fail, then you need to write a conclusion as to why it failed. So in this case, we'd write a corrective action plan. And this says one or more combustion appliances failed worst case draft test, see corrective action plan below. So in this case, the, and then we're gonna name the appliance, we're gonna say the furnace, has been either a disabled or left in service. In this case, what are we going to do with the furnace? It's, say it's, well, it was this morning in Logan, so it's a little chilly. Based on what we have here, would you guys disable it or would you leave it in service? I would say disable it. 
the, well, let's, the answer is depends. Let's, depends on what's going on uh, at your agency. Let's take a look at our numbers. So our, our minimum draft pressure, our minimum draft pressure that we need to achieve is negative 1.8, correct? Now we did not achieve our minimum draft pressure, but we are venting because we're negative. So we are a negative 1.5, albeit we are not at our minimum acceptable draft pressure, but the furnace is venting still, and our CO levels are low, correct? So yeah. in this case, if it were me, and your agency can have its own policy on this, but if it were me, I would just note this and not disable it, because the furnace is still venting. It's just not venting at negative 1.8, but I'm at negative 1.5, and my CO is relatively low. So I would note this furnace failed based solely off of draft pressure. It's not spilling, but it failed based off of draft pressure, and the CO is low. So if it was me, I would leave it in service, because we know it's not a you know an immediate someone's going to die type of situation. Yes, it fell, based on enough, but it's not going to kill anyone immediately. Now, your agency may have a policy. doesn't matter. It fails, it fails. It doesn't matter how it fails, why it fails, what it fails. You disable it. Um, I think in some situations, disabling it is a little extreme, especially if it's really cold outside. Um, in this case, we know that furnace isn't going to kill anyone immediately. So. Just my two cents worth. So let's take, and the point here is is that whoever's, you know, in the field between you and your coordinators, uh, you're going to make, you need to make a decision about it and then document your decision. And that's why I, you know, I, I want you guys to put the CO level there so that you've got all the information here and you can, you can come up with a good answer. Now let's let's go to the other end of the spectrum while we're talking about it. Let's say our vent pressure on that furnace after 60 seconds under normal conditions, this is not worst case, was a, a positive 1.5 and my CO was 300 parts per million. Then what would you do? Turn it off. Yeah, then I'd be disabling it because now that thing is spilling copious amounts of CO into the house. And I probably don't want to leave that there for the client. So I would more than likely disable it and develop an action plan, an immediate action plan to take care of it. So if we disabled it, let's, well, we'll, we'll go through the left in service. But if we disabled it and you had a client's signature there and a technician signature and the client died the next day, and you're in court a month later, and you have this document, that's your get-out-of-jail-free card. Yep. <laughs> that, that, again, doomsday scenario, that is one of the reasons why we're documenting all this. So in, in this scenario, if say you've made the decision to leave it in service, and you're going to leave it in service for the following reasons. So you need to document. The furnace failed. Um, it's off of draft pressure, but it is venting, and the CO is low. The weatherization agency will what? You need to write down what you're going to do, and you need to write down what the client is going to do. This will typically represent any client ed that you've given them. So the weatherization agency will return within three days to repair the furnace. The client will what? What kind of advice would we give the client if we were going to leave this in service? Is there anything that they need to know? Don't run the dryer. <laughs> say, say one of these appliances was really causing some major depressurization. You know, if it was the dryer, then that could be part of what the client will do. So, and that, guys, is why we have to go through the process and check. I mean, th this is really what it boils down to. If you determine through your testing, through being the detective, hey, the dryer in conjunction with this door being closed is what causes this appliance to become dangerous. It's perfectly fine to educate the client and say, hey, look, client, here's what causes the dangerous situation. We won't be able to get back for two weeks. So in the meantime, don't create this situation. We'll come back and fix it. And as long as you document that, you're pretty, pretty good to go. I was in a home where uh, we had an appliance that was backdrafting and we found that uh, 
by cracking the kitchen window the and putting it back into worst case we ran it through the test with the kitchen window open and it would it had a nice strong draft so what we did was we while we were there we cut a block of wood to keep the window from sliding open so that you know they couldn't get robbed and we had the client sign that they would leave their kitchen window open until we returned and the client signed the signature there and I I like this because when I do it on my tablet, I, I literally emailed the client a copy of this right while I was sitting in their kitchen. Um, but I had them sign that, and now we have a very clear corrective action plan. The client knows what we're doing. You guys know what you're doing, and you've written it all down. And then just be aware, this box with the client's signature, it's only when, you, uh, when it fails. We don't need a client's signature when everything else passes only when it fails. So you've written your plan, you have the client sign it. Um, and that's it on our corrective action plan. There's the notes field, so you can, if you have notes that you, you know, if you want, if you need further explanation, use that. And then the last thing on this form, which is required every time, is what Wade talked about earlier, is that whoever conducted this test needs to sign their name to it. That's how we know that you're not just photocopying this form and that's where you as a technician, you as an auditor or a QCI or a field guy, you take ownership of this. You're documenting, you put your name on there, you're saying this is exactly what I found and then you put the date that you signed it which typically should be the same date as the date the test was conducted. So. Now, be aware, technicians, when you sign this, make sure that it's filled out correctly and make sure that uh, you feel good about putting your name on that because, again, doomsday worst-case scenario, if, if there were ever issues with this, you could lose certifications from the state. So make sure you're doing your job properly because we don't ever want it to go there. We just want these forms filled out and everybody doing things correctly. Any questions on this form or concerns about it? I've got a question. Yeah. What if this uh, fails worst case and passes normal case? Um, that same thing. Like when when you come down here, you anytime it fails, so you've selected fail here, then you you need to write a corrective action plan. So say we only had a water heater and it failed under worst case but it's drafting under normal conditions what other information would we want to know about that water heater here's a hint we'd want to know how much CO it's putting out right and also what it is fail with what caused it to fail is that what you're saying or are you saying the yeah, like what caused it to fail, like with the exhaust fan or whatever. Yeah, and your testing up above will give you those clues. Yeah, that we should have an indication up here. So you're you're going to put all those pieces of the puzzle together in your corrective action plan. So you could say my water heater has been left in service because it's drafting normally or drafting well under normal conditions, and the CO is low, and the weatherization agency will do whatever you're going to do and the client will do whatever the client's going to do. So does that answer your question? Like it, it, if it passes under normal case, that's okay. It's still failed. So you're still going to write a corrective action plan, but you can leave it in service sometimes. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. So long as the client understands what worst case is. So again, we go back to what was said before, perhaps worst case or the thing that's causing it to backdraft under worst case is the dryer in a door position. So then you go and do it under normal conditions with the dryer off and that door open or whatever the case may be, and it vents just fine. So your corrective action plan until you can get back to correct worst case is, hey, client, here's what causes your water heater to backdraft, running your dryer and closing this door. Don't do those two things at the same time. Okay? We'll come back and fix this. It might take us a week to get back. But you know that the only time it's dangerous is under worst case, and you can provide the client with guidance to not create those conditions until you get back. 
and have them sign that you explained it to them and that they understand. Now, if it backdrafts under worst and normal case and the CO is high, that's probably where you need to look at disabling the equipment. If you have questions about any of these, reach out to your coordinators, reach out to Wade or Dalton or myself. You know, we can all we can put our heads together and, and usually come up with a good answer. So any other questions on this one? Or any any even anybody have best practices or suggestions that we haven't addressed here? All right. Well, hopefully this was helpful. Did we cover? I've got what just one thing I want to cover, and I'll try to make it quick here, guys. I know we're way over time. But we ran into a situation now in our monitoring a, a couple of times, a unique situation that kind of surprised everyone. So I, I was going to try to have a PowerPoint with pictures for you because pictures make this easier to understand. But let's see if I can paint a picture in your head for you. So imagine you're in a house. And the house has a window-mounted swamp cooler in a bedroom, okay? And in that same bedroom is a supply register in the floor from the furnace system, okay? So what do you think in that house with that situation, that bedroom with a swamp cooler in it, a window-mounted swamp cooler, and a supply register in the floor, what is going to be worst-case condition when you run your CAS test? Is it going to be with that bedroom door open or that bedroom door closed, and why? Who can, who can identify that and explain the reason behind it for me? Was the swamp cooler taped off? Nope, the swamp cooler was not taped off. We left it in its normal conditions because it was summertime when we were there, so the swamp cooler had wide open vents. Okay. Well, that made George's case more negative. When what happens? Give me more detail. A little turn more. Turn the air handler on. And because it's blown that where's the bedroom door? Where's the bedroom door position? Open or closed? Closed. Closed. Okay. So we ran into this a couple of times, and again, let me explain it so hopefully you can understand. I thought we were supposed to close off everything to the outside before we did that, so that air conditioner, the swamp cooler, would be closed off before you started the test. It would be, but you'd want to test it again. Because this is what we found, okay? And you're right on track there, Jason. Yeah, normally you'd go out and close the swamp cooler off because it's providing combustion air to the house. But here's what we found, and here's why I wanted to bring this to your guys' attention. Under normal conditions, that bedroom door, there is a possibility that it could be closed and that that swamp cooler is not closed off, okay? And that the client does turn the furnace on. And we're getting into that time of season when it could happen. So they've got this window-mounted swamp cooler just sitting there with no kind, of, no kind of way to effectively close it off from the outdoors, if you will. And that bedroom door is closed and they turn the air handler on. Because that supply register is in that bedroom, with that bedroom door closed, that supply register is now blowing a ton of air to the outdoors. And that's exactly the same thing as an exhaust fan. So we ran into this situation a couple of times now, and it was kind of an eye-opener for all of us. We went, wow. And in both cases, that condition created massive negative pressure. Because think about it. A supply register can deliver 150 to 175 CFM. And if that's all blowing to the outdoors, it's the same exact thing as having a 150 to 175 CFM exhaust fan operating in the house. So we wanted to bring it to your attention because some of you will probably run into that. Now, would you normally block that swamp cooler off when you do your CAS testing? Yes, you would, but you also want to take that tape off and test this situation if, if you run into this configuration. Again, it was a window-mounted swamp cooler in a back bedroom. They didn't have a cover. And they had, the yeah, thing. they had no cover for it. You, you know the uh, kind of equipment we run into. So we got this window mounted swamp cooler with a great big hole, no cover for it. And it's perfectly conceivable that especially this time of year where it's starting to get chilly, that that client closes the bedroom door. They're not going to put any kind of cover or anything over their swamp cooler. Maybe if we're lucky, they'll stick a pillow in it. And they turn the furnace on. And all of a sudden, that creates this big negative pressure. So we just wanted to bring it to your attention because it's this weird anomaly that we found twice now. 
and we suspect we'll run across it again. But just so you guys are aware of it, if you run into that condition, test that. Test that theory, you know. Untape that swamp cooler, close that bedroom door, and turn the furnace on and see what happens. We were really surprised at how negative it made the house go. And uh, that would be a great... Uh... I mean, it, it took our cast from a negative 1 to like a negative 5 yeah. or a negative 6. Yeah, our, our cows on the last one we ran into was a negative 1. And then when we created that condition with the swamp cooler in the bedroom, we went to a negative 6. I mean, that's big time. That would be a great... Uh example of how you would use the other box here on the form. You you'd document what's going on with your swamp cooler and, and then the effect on the CAS pressure. So, And that's the other beauty of these meetings, guys, is, is you run into these weird things in the field, because you're in the field way more than we are. You know, bring them up. Let's talk about them. This, this is one of those strange anomalies that we just never thought about until we went there and watched it happen. All right, any other comments or questions or anything? Okay, um, just quickly, our next meeting, again, will be the first Tuesday of every month. I'll uh, send out a link. Hopefully, it'll be at least a day before, not just five minutes before. Sorry to anybody who missed this because of my lack of email. Uh, so October 4th is the first Tuesday of October. We'll have our meeting. Um, and... We will uh, we'll pick a training topic. If anybody has any suggestions, just email them to me. Um, I won't take the time to talk about that right now. So thank you very much for attending, um, and everybody have a good day. Thank you.